Hi, this is Misha, and today we're going to look again at the Italian Beretta, or Beretta, you guys like it when I say it that way, ARX 100, which is the semi-auto civilian and LE version, and talk about the history of the ARX 160, 160, which is the select fire military version currently in service over in Italy. We've talked about this gun on and off several times. Our last video, just about it, was over three years ago though, and it was more of a range video, pretty short, just a few minutes. So I thought it was time again. There's a lot of misinformation out there about these guns. Also, in the intervening years, the price has really dropped. These guns are now $899. Before, they were around $1,400, which I could understand maybe, you know, and the, the looks aren't to everyone's liking. And at $1,400, you know, you, you need to like everything about a gun to spend that money. But at $900, which is the cost of a mid-tier AR, or even uh, just a typical AK, this is really a gun worth considering, guys. They are a lot lighter weight than you might expect. They're actually a lot smaller than they look. The, it looks larger than it really is. It's kind of a visual thing. But um, there's a lot to recommend this gun. And it is one of the only true 100% ambidextrous guns on the market. There are very few guns that come even close to its uh, left-hand friendliness, not to mention all other features like swappable barrels, easy cleaning. Um, they're just really well-done guns. So for an $899, $900, you really, really should look at one of these closer. And, and don't just shoot one if you can. Don't just judge it based on looks. Also, don't judge it based on the ARX 16022. The full-size 5.56 caliber gun is a different critter than the 22. The 22 is obviously not made anywhere near as tough. It doesn't have as much metal. The polymer is not mil-spec. The real McCoy feels a lot different and a lot better. I'm, I just bring this up because a lot of people have told me they've handled the 22 and that turned them off. So, just mentioning that. Let's get into the history of where this all came from. Well, before the Italian military, their first 223 5.56 gun was this here. This is the Beretta AR-70-223. This was used by Special Forces as well as the Navy and the Air Force throughout the 70s and 80s while the standard issue gun in the army was the BM-59, still in 7.62 NATO, based on the M1 Garand. However, by 85, it, they decided to go make the full switch to 5.56, and Beretta reworked this gun into the AR-7090, which after trials was adopted in 1990, and became standard issue throughout the Army, Navy, Air Force, and so on and so forth. And this uh, suited Italy very well. They would get about 100,000 purchasing the last guns. The, the, the main last order was in 1999, but there was a small order in 2008. Uh, but that was for folding stock carmides for so kind of specialist guns. Around 2004, Italy began the Future Soldier Program. Much like a lot of the early 21st century programs in the U.S., the idea was to make a weapons system, not just a rifle, for the soldier, using updated polymers, uh, modular optics, even computerized targeting and, and data and stuff. Also, though, much like in the U.S., the program didn't really go anywhere, but it took years to find out. This is where the roots of the ARX-160 lie. The rifle that would become this started off as the rifle portion of the Future Soldier program. In 2008, Beretta would spin the rifle off, selling it by itself on the commercial international military market. At that time, the Italian military was still interested in the Future Soldier program as a complete package. So they thought, well, we'll just sell the rifle portion as a standalone 
uh, piece of hardware. It immediately garnered attention. For one thing, Beretta is a very well-respected company. It is the oldest arms manufacturer in the world, and it is still privately owned by the family. That's, that's pretty astounding. And of course, just the Beretta quality. People were curious to see where they would go from the AR-7090 to the modern 21st century. This ended up being the Italian military. In 2009, they started to acquire a few hundred guns. The initial batch totaled of 800 that they received by 2010, and they tested the ARX-160 and decided that, you know, after all, it was worth uh, probably adopting and starting to replace the AR-7090 with. So they would order more. In 2011, they would obtain 900 of the Special Forces version, the ARX-160. The main difference between the two, the standard rifle version has a 406 millimeter barrel, so just right at 16 inches. Some people say 15.9, some people say 16. This is chrome-lined, cold hammer forged, one and seven twist. It's a pretty light pencil profile because they try to keep this whole gun light. It could have a bayonet lug up here on the top of the barrel. The SF version would have a shorter 12 inch barrel, otherwise the specs would be the same. They would also start to acquire about 7,000 more rifles in this period. And the following year they would officially declare the ARX-160 as the new standard issue rifle for the Army, Navy, Air Force and as the AR-7090's replacement. They would place a further order first getting another 3,000 or so, and so on and so forth. They would also introduce the ARX-160A2 as a slightly updated and militarized version for the Italians. Mostly just different little things. In the same time period, 2012, they would introduce a version in 762 by 39 for export. This wouldn't be for the Italians, this would be for export. And this version would actually be selected by the, uh, by the nation of Kazakhstan. They would adopt it for their special forces. So there was a military contract for this version. There was a thought to do a version in 5.45 by 39 by certain nations still using the Soviet caliber. But this never went much of anywhere. By the 21st century, very few nations were still using it, and those that were, well, you just did that really neatly, didn't you? We're already hoping to kind of switch away to get to 5.56 NATO to standardize with their allies. So the 5.45 version was only ever considered in 2013 and never went much of anywhere. When did the cat bipod become standard issue? With still being tested, uh, they're having some trouble with temperaments. Uh, but they're going to work on it. They're going to maybe think about tranquilizing the cats a little bit so they stay still. In 2014, they would work on the ARX-160A3, which had a few more relatively minor updates. It would go to larger cooling slots up here for the barrel. They would also introduce a slip-over cocking handle for a larger grip because this one is quite small. We'll show you why it has to be small in a minute. They would also slightly redesign the pistol grip, and they would offer a full-length lower rail. By 2016, the Italian military has about 30,000 ARX-160s in service, and so by this year, 2018, they, they have more. They've been slowly replacing the 7090 with these, as I said and, and before. They had about 100,000 7090s, so they still have some to replace. They may not end up replacing them all, but um, they're, they're getting there. About a third or more are replaced today. Some people think that the ARX-160 is itself being replaced by the ARX-200, which is not the same gun, although it's in the same family, and it's chambered for 7.62 NATO. This is because in late 2015, the Italian military did order some ARX-200s, 
but they only ordered about 1,200, which have been delivered. These were meant for DMR use as well as battle rifle use, so much like how we use ours, our, our uh, 7.62 NATO guns, but you know our M4s aren't going anywhere. So there are no plans to get rid of the ARX-160 as standard issue, but it will be supplemented where it needs to be by the ARX-200. And that is pretty much the status today. This has received a lot of attention on the international market. A lot of nations have looked at it, including the USA, when they were doing the XM-8 program. Other nations have adopted it, Egypt being one who had used the AR-70 before. As I said, Kazakhstan. Albania has selected it for its standard issue gun. Argentina has looked at it, but has not adopted it, at least not yet. And so on and so forth. So it's a tough market out there, but at least this one has received more attention than other modern guns. And that's because it has a lot of neat features. It's not as radical as a bullpup. We still have a standard layout gun, but it is definitely uh, a step forward from the AR-70 and AR-70-90 and even the M4 in a lot of ways. So let's look at a few of the features. As I already talked about the barrel, it's topped by a typical A2 style flash hider on half by 28 threads. We can have a bayonet lug here. We have an adjustable gas regulator with two positions, one for standard, one for adverse, which is pretty common these days. We have a rotating sling swivel here that can rotate to either side. We have additional sling brackets here and here on the receiver and even another one on the stock. And those are mirrored on this side so the sling mount can be ambidextrous. We have a full length top rail made of metal. We have standard backup iron sights. I know these sights are a little goofy, but it does come with them and they are just back up. We have a hood I'm going to point this at you. We had a protected front post that is adjustable. It is also quick detachable from the rail using a bullet tip. Very easy to do. You just press the end with the bullet tip and it slides right off. Also locks down. The rear sight has an adjustable drum and it goes from 100 to 600 meters and it too is quick detachable and locks down very easily. On the side we have two short rails for devices. We have a very short front rail that I've got a Beretta stubby foregrip on, relatively stubby. Because that's on there I can't show you what's under here, but this panel comes off with this little lip and there is a mount for a proprietary grenade launcher under there. That would be the GLX 40, which was a low velocity grenade launcher developed during the Future Soldier program by Beretta 2, and it is often marketed with this gun as an optional uh, accessory. You can also mount a standard rail under here if you like. But I find this foregrip to actually be quite comfortable. We have curve here. We have kind of a bulge here for the hand. I find it to give kind of a nice grip, almost kind of like an angled foregrip style. Moving on. We have a pretty standard A2 grip that's integrated into this lower housing. We ha it has a storage compartment for gear. Use a bullet tip to access it. The stock is adjustable with four positions. Has a pretty typical convex style plate. Just made of polymer, but it is checkered. It folds over to the side. And this it does lock in under like some guns. And it feeds from standard M16 AR-15 magazines. The ones that the rifle 
is issued with and the semi comes with are 30 rounds made of steel. They're very heavy duty, very good mags. It will feed from most other mags. It only has a problem with some Magpul Gen 3s and a few other polymers. And it's not really the rifle's fault, it's more the mags, because the rifle will take standard Stanag spec mags. It's those mags that actually don't meet the spec. So, can't really blame the rifle when the mags aren't made to the original spec. As I said in the beginning, this is fully ambidextrous. Some of the stuff you would guess, like the selector lever, the mag release is mirrored on both sides as is the bolt release and there's even a third one down here but the ARX goes even further the charging handle the reason it's so short is because it can easily be reversed to the other side you just line it up with a notch here like that, pull it out and then rotate it through the port and then out the other side like that and then if you press in it it'll snap forward but I'm gonna leave it out because that's how you also you disassemble it there you can also change ejection by simply taking a bullet tip to this hole by pressing either side you can make it eject out of the right or the left which is why you have a two-sided ejection port. Basically what this hole does is it selects your extractor and ejector. The two devices are the same, they just change duties. If it's on the right, one side acts as the ejector and the other side acts as the extractor. And when you put it on the left, they switch roles. It's also good if one is broken, it gives you a backup. Another neat feature, this has quick change barrels. So I'm gonna do this a little different. I'm gonna take the bolt out first. I think that's easier before I take the barrel out, folks. Disassembly is quite easy. See here? What you do, you take your selector and you put it on safe and then you push it up one notch further. Then you can push in the back here it's in and it comes out one reason it was fighting me and it's because I had the bolt partially back so there was more spring tension that was my, my bad not a big deal the bolt unit slides out of the back now we'll take that barrel out it's easier to do when your bolts not in there the barrel has kind of a, a Glock style system for coming out with two levers you just squeeze them down and pull the sling even has a thoughtful quick disconnect so you don't have to unravel your sling to get that out and that is field strip and pretty much strip in general all we're left with here is a shell there's nothing in here just some metal reinforced polymer So yeah, that is that. I'm just gonna set this over to the side. So let's look at what we have here. This is our barrel group. You see it's a self-contained group. We have here is our extension. This is our gas system. This is a short stroke piston. This piston head is basically always in contact with the bolt carrier and it moves when it fires it presses back hitting the carrier and then when it goes forward it still keeps contact this keeps a, a less jarring more consistent recoil impulse it's kind of a smoother shooting thing which is actually a very good thing since this is not a terribly heavy gun for a modern railed up gun it only weighs about six and a half to seven pounds depending on what exactly is on it which is quite light it's lighter than a standard m4 and definitely lighter than an m4a1 this is our bolt group have a typical recoil spring here you 
can see the multi head here. Move the other way. Here's our head. This is our carrier. Pretty standard, guys. And our trigger pack. Here we are. Put, take my safety off so you can see. This is our hammer, quite small. Notice the magwell comes with it as a piece. This was good because when they did the 76239 version, it made converting it very easy. It even means you can have a 556 version and with a new lower and a new barrel and a new bolt you can convert this gun is pretty reasonably sized of course the barrel links they make these in several with the 16 inch barrel depending on exactly where you have your stock adjusted it's at about 34 to 36 inches with the stock out. And I'm going to get my finger there with the sling swivel. Good stuff. And with the stock folded over, we're at about 26 inches. Quite compact. Now they do make shorter barrels. Like I said, there's the SF version, which by standard has a 12 inch. There is also a 10 inch version. Some websites have reported other lengths, like 11 and 14, but I really couldn't find much evidence of this on Berettas. So let's just say that the common lengths tend to be, I got here, I got my bolt head up. The common lengths tend to be either 16, 12, or 10. It's a very ambidextrous gun. It is very lightweight. Okay. Because it comes apart so easily, I'll go ahead and install it on this side. Why not? Push it in and then we're forward. They're very easy to clean and maintain. We've had extreme reliability with these, as long as you're not using Tula ammo. Jay had an incident with Tula in this that he can go into if he wishes. But let's just say I am not a fan of Tula, 223 Tula especially. To get this back in, you press your safety into that disassembly notch, which is up. Then you can press that in further line everything up correctly get my notch back down there this is a lot easier to do guys when you're just in a standard normal position it's just because I'm on a table it makes it a little more difficult looking and that is back together hey guys it's Jay uh, the incident he mentioned specifically with Tula is I had a 500 round case I bought like seven years ago of steel cased uh, Tula ammo and uh, shot probably 300 rounds in very quick succession and ended up breaking a firing pin. I had an, up until that point never had an issue with this ARX and I probably put about 2,000 rounds through mine. I love shooting this gun. Uh, the recoil impulse is just non-existent. It's very straight back. You get no muzzle climb and it's very lightweight. So these things are going for like 900 bucks right now and to me in my mind the trigger is, as I would say, military heavy, but everything else is so well thought out that for what they're going for right now, you would, you're would you really missing out if you don't pick one up at that price. Bye. <laughs> yeah, I thought he might want to share that. And we really kind of, we looked at the casing, and it looked like it was the ammo that had a, uh, was a ruptured primer, wasn't it? Yes. 
Yeah, so it looks like the primer ruptured and that did funky things to the bolt face and basically had a lot of gas blow back into the firing pin channel. And the gun itself was fine, but it, <laughs> it goofed up the firing pin pretty good. So we're going to blame that ammo for that primer not doing what it was supposed to do. I, too, have had very good experience with mine being very reliable. I do like the recoil impulse. For a gun this light, it's very, very manageable, very, very pleasant, especially on the standard gas setting. Even on the adverse, it's not going to beat you up. And honestly, this is on my short list of guns. I think I might SBR. Now that they're no longer super hard to get and expensive, that they're reasonable, I may uh, put a stamp on this because Beretta does offer, and we'll put up a picture, an SBR conversion kit that's pretty neat. It comes with a 10 inch barrel assembly, a small carrying case, just like the one that the ARX 100 ships with, just smaller, and a spare 30 round mag. So it's kind of neat that there is an official factory SBR kit and that you're not committed to one barrel length or the other, you just drop whichever one you want to use in because of the QD barrel system. The only thing about the QD, just like I said, make sure your bolt's back. I like to lock mine in the middle position I wouldn't rely on the, uh, the bolt hold open to hold it back in case it gets stripped because you don't want that bolt to go forward with your barrel out of the gun. So just a word of advice there. If you're changing barrels, use the middle position because there's no way the bolt can fly forward. So yeah, that is the ARX 160. Kind of felt like it needed a little uh, extra love and attention. As I said, this is a vertical grip. This sling is a Breda sling, but it's a simple two-point sling. The ones these come with are very fancy and also very long and kind of heavy three-point slings. I just like the simple slings, so that's why I put this on one on mine. Your mileage may vary. This is just a primary arms optic, uh, kind of an aim point clone. That's because the militaries often have some type of aim point on these. Really the only negatives I can say about this gun the stock, even fully extended, is a little short. For me, it's okay, but I'm not a very tall person. For anyone over six foot, though, there's not a lot of length here. Also, this butt plate being just polymer, it'd be nice if it was a rubber butt plate, I would say. The good part is this part, this extension part, is a separate piece and easily removed from the, I guess you'd call it the first section, the, the arm here. So potentially someone could make a replacement piece here and still not have to drive out the hinge pin. So you might be able to do that. It'd be kind of nice. Also the pistol grip, since it is part of the lower, I don't mind an A2 grip, I'm very used to it. But some people don't like that they can't take their grip off and go to a different grip. This small charging handle is something that's not very comfortable. As you saw, there's a reason it is, exists because that was what the Italian military wanted. But I will say when you go to cock it, make sure you don't knock your hand against either your scope or the brass deflector, it's on both sides. And they do make a slip over extension, which costs 20 bucks. It's probably a really good investment. Finally, the trigger. It's not, I, I think how horrible these are is overstated. It is a wide trigger, so it's relatively comfortable. Yes, it's polymer. Has a little bit of initial grit. But it's not that heavy. It really isn't. I felt much worse. It actually feels a lot like a Glock trigger to me. So I think people complain a little more than they is really honest about these. But then again, different guns, maybe theirs are heavier. Mine has always been quite uh, a decent trigger, including Jay's. Not great, not a match trigger, but it's not, say, like a Tavor SAR trigger either. So I would just equate it to a standard Glock trigger or similar. That is about it. Well, if you have any questions about the ARX, we'd love to uh, talk about it below, especially now that they're more in an affordable price range. We just felt like it needed a little more attention. There are a few myths about these. For one, the polymer not being strong enough. I think this comes from the 16022. The actual ARX100 is made from the same mil-spec polymer as the ARX160 and will hold up plenty well. These will feed for most all mags. All metal mags we've tried work. 
the only times they don't are, like I said earlier, the, the, the polymer mags that aren't made to the original Stanad spec. Yeah, I think that's about the only miss I can think of. Like I said, there is a lower rail replacement for this handguard if you would prefer to have a long rail. Me, I don't really need one. I think it's comfortable. But, um, yeah, that's all I can really think of as far as that. They're, they're really a lot better of a gun than the internet gives them credit for. And most everyone I know that has given them a chance with first-hand experience has come away thinking the same. So I'll end this video on a story. I got my first one in 2014, late at Christmas. The wife was out of town for a few days and it came in. Jay came over, he laughed at it thinking it was a guppy. Even I was, you know, it was different, indifference good. But I was sold on it the first time we shot it, and a month or so later. And Jay went from a little bit laughing at it to wanting one of his own and eventually getting one a year later. And so there you go. The proof is in actually using these and feeling how nice they shoot. And it's funny, a, a not great trigger when you're just dry firing at home is one thing. But when you go to shoot, a lot of that trigger stuff goes away. I don't know, you don't, you don't seem to notice triggers as much when you're actually out there having fun and the gun is recoiling and you're aiming. So I think the whole trigger thing on all kinds of guns gets a little bit overstated because of at home dry firing. So the last piece of advice, don't shoot too ammo out of these because the primer might rupture. Other than that, we've had no problem with steel or brass, and that's on the standard gas setting, so rock away. The one in seven twist means you can fire 55 grain. That's kind of another old wives tale that you can't. You can, you can shoot 55 out of a one in seven. One, and you know, 62 will work fine, and you know, 77 grain will work fine. The, the lightweight barrel, is perfectly good for military grade accuracy and also helps keep the gun under seven pounds so this isn't meant to be a DMR and so between having a heavy barrel which might lend a smidge more accuracy and, ha and saving a you know quarter to a half pound I'll go with saving the weight because that's what this gun's meant to be small compact as possible for a standard battle rifle and it would probably remain in Italian military service for many years to come. So yeah, we advise you to check one out. If you have any questions we haven't answered, I can't imagine what it be by now because I've rambled on for so long, but if you have any, put them in the comments. We'll do our best. If you like the video, please click like and also check out some of our other Italian playlist videos. And if you'd like to help support us so we can get to the range a little more often, please click the link and check out our Patreon page. This is Misha with input from Jay today, and we'll both catch you next time.